<laughs> okay, we're about to start. <laughs> One of these days. I'm like half ten. Yeah, really. Okay, welcome to uh, SACOG's special workshop on suburban placemaking. Uh, really appreciate you coming out today. Um, Today we're going to do a, a session with Michelle Reeves to talk about suburban placemaking. She's been here the whole week working with different jurisdictions and communities talking about their corridors and uh, redevelopment opportunities. Um, we have a couple of announcements, uh, uh, just a couple of logistics right off the bat. Uh, first of all, particularly those of you sitting near microphones, if you can put your cell phones away, they interfere with the uh, microphones with the, with the full system. That'd be great. Uh, bathrooms are uh, go back towards the receptionist and to the right. Uh, you'll see them there. Uh, we have coffee and water. Feel free to help yourselves on those. Um, Cable Channel 14 is going to be videotaping this, uh, and we're going to uh, likely post this on the SACOG website because we've had a lot of interest in the presentations that Michelle's been making. So this is the, the broadest audience uh, presentation that she'll be making this week. So uh, I want to thank Sacramento County and Cable 14 for, for uh, taping this. Um, also, if you're here for AICP credits, uh, be sure to sign in. And also to fill out the, the blue form, uh, you can pick them up over here if you haven't, uh, and turn them in. Um, that uh, We just need to make sure we cover that. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, SACOG's uh, Chief Executive Officer, Mike McKeever, to just say a few words. Well, thank you. Thank you all for... Uh, given us some time on your uh, this Friday morning. I just want to uh, say a couple of contextual things as this uh, presentation you're going to hear today relates to work that's go going on at SACOG. Uh, as most of you know, we have the unusual situation that under federal and state uh, laws and rules, we have to sort of constantly be updating our metropolitan transportation plan. Every four years it has to be updated. And we have, the board has not made a, a final decision on this yet. That will, that will come in December. But there's a lot of discussion on our board about, for the current plan update, really focusing on implementation issues in the short term, here and now. Let's, you know, we've got a good plan. Let's, let's spend most of our time figuring out how to implement it rather than this cycle revisiting big picture issues like are we going in the right direction and do we have the exact right growth projection and things like that. Uh, I want to acknowledge our, uh, the chair of the board's uh, Land Use and Natural Resources Committee uh, for a few years, Roberta McGlashan, Sacramento County Supervisor and, uh, and, plan and planner. <laughs> Very, very happy to have you here. And Linda Budge from, uh, Mayor Budge from Rancho Cordova, she has been, she's an alternate on the SACOG board at the moment, but she served for a number of years, and she chaired the Land Use Committee for a number of years as well. So we're really delighted to have both of you here. So another theme that the board is spending a lot of attention on right now is this suburban issue. Uh, and in some ways, it's it's a it's a word that creates uh, divisions that are that are not necess necessarily useful or helpful. But there is uh, a dynamic in the the areas that are outside of the the core of the city of Sacramento uh, that do have a dynamic of their own. And so we're really trying to get more smarter about what those economic dynamics are, what the social dynamics are. Uh, some of you may have seen in uh, this morning's B, there's a very interesting column by another SACOG board member, David Sander, from the city of Rancho Cordova, who has been uh, a real uh, pusher on the SACOG board, along with several other board members, to sort of get this issue front and center. And so when I learned about the Portland State University Urban uh, Sustainability Accelerator, very craftily titled to be USA, uh, I don't know how long it took Robert to figure that out. I'm sure a microbrewer too was involved in that. <laughs> um, uh, we, they, it's not quite uh, 
no cost technical assistance to us locally, but it's it's close to that. It's it's uh, so we we worked with three of our members who wanted to do some case studies on implementation of plans that they already have and and figuring out how to be more successful at that. And so Sacramento County, uh, Rancho Cordova, and Elk Grove were the three members that we've been working with. And several of us took a trip to Portland three or four months ago. And most of you know I've, I spent a good part of my uh, uh, cutting my planting teeth in, in Portland um, and actually came down here at about the time that Michelle Reeves was coming to Portland. So we, we met each other three months ago. <laughs> Uh, in a neighborhood where I used to live where she was taking us on a tour of buildings and projects that happened that I had experienced as a uh, sometimes visitor to Portland now as wonderful and I got the inside story of how those happened. And so I'm, you will figure out very quickly what this, uh, this person knows how to do. I will just say uh, in my career as a planner, I. It, I don't know that I've run into anybody who has the street smarts and the details, very specific counsel and advice and track record to prove that it's worth listening to uh, in terms of how to do small-scale infill revitalization in neighborhoods, in individual buildings, uh, very extremely impressive. And so I, I don't, you'll figure it out, I don't need to build her up anymore, but I'm really looking, really glad to see you here, really looking uh, forward to the morning. And I've, got, I've been getting rave reviews from our members from the three separate days she spent on the ground. So I know she knows what the individual uh, dynamics are in our region. Uh, and so we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So a little, <laughs> a little background about Michelle. Uh, she's the founder of Civilis Consultants to assist commercial districts, businesses, and large public sector organizations to recognize and leverage their strengths, accomplish economic development goals, and craft their unique uh, stories to create compelling, multifaceted brands. She has private sector experience working with developers assessing feasibility for commercial and mixed use infill and redevelopment projects, especially in emerging districts that are undergoing demographic changes. She has particular expertise uh, in developing projects in neighborhood commercial districts, in historic downtowns, all areas that require deft, a deft touch and a product that appeals to a much targeted niche of the office retail market. Uh, some of our areas of specialty are in the retail office market analysis, market-based design, uh, the building program, and performance development. With that, I introduce Michelle Reeves. It's going to take me a second to adjust to, m I'm used to projecting, so I, I over microphone. Um, to be careful about that. Are we set up? Uh, well, thank you, Mike, for the, I feel like I need to knock on wood after that, that intro. It's early. Um, so, uh, well, first I have to start with some gratitude, and I need to start with the mouthful that is the Portland State University Urban Sustainability Accelerator, who is co-sponsoring this work, um, as is SACOG. And the group from SACOG has been so fantastic and organized and um, has really arranged a, a whirlwind tour. So it's been really fun to be out in different parts of the county and different communities that are uh, surrounding Sacramento. So I've had a great time, and uh, it's been you know, a learning process for me as well. Um, before I dive into uh, largely what I'm going to talk about today, which is kind of how you tackle existing corridors, um, I I'm going to spend just a little bit of time kind of talking about what choices you have with your corridors. And these are it right here. You have two choices. <laughs> so you can either change them or you can leverage what they are. And what we're really talking about is the speed of the corridor. So if you have a corridor that people are driving 45 to 55 miles an hour, which is essentially a freeway, you got one set of choices of what you can do with it. If you want to change that so it's a, a road that people drive 25 or 30 miles an hour, then you have a different set of choices um, in what you can do with that. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit today about changing it uh, and mostly about leveraging with which is what you do if you keep it at 45 to 55. But these are really great stories, um, and, and I wanted to share them with you today, some dramatic stories of what happens if you change uh, that environment. 
And the first story is uh, Lancaster Boulevard, and some of you have probably heard of this. But Elizabeth Mole um, and her firm did a lot of the work on this, and I, I just need to give her a shout out because she gave me all these before and after pictures, which was very sweet of her to share with you. So I did not work on this project, uh, but it's so impressive and, and really, really relevant to anybody who has a corridor. So Lancaster, California is on the edge of Los Angeles County, and um, they had a Lancaster Boulevard in their downtown. Let me see if I get the pointer right, which is right here. Uh, and it's gonna look pretty familiar to a lot of people. It was uh, like a highway, high speeds, bookended by large arterials, uh, which you can see here, um, and uh, a lot of dead retail and, and a pretty wide street. So the right-of-way on this street was about 100 feet, uh, which is hard to create a, a really quaint environment in. Uh, they had a limited budget, uh, and they did not have you know, stellar demographics that people are looking for to put in uh, high-end national credit tenants. So these before pictures all look, I think, pretty familiar to most people. So they were looking at this street, and the community had really been wanting some change and something uh, pretty dynamic and vibrant to happen there. So they had a real appetite for creativity, which is part of the uh, ingredient list for changing it. And they were really inspired by Barcelona, or maybe I should say Barcelona. Um, uh, and Las Ramblas there. And so they wanted to implement something like that here. So they started by putting a Ramblas paver down the center. Um, and it could be used, and you can see that it's striped uh, for parking. And so that restricted the street now to one lane in each direction on either side of that. They put in festival lighting uh, through the middle of it so that the parking area that you see there could be closed off and it could become uh, a festival area in the middle of the street. And they plan to plant it with streets or with trees. So um, that, that's pretty dramatic. And those are the, the, the rendering drawings, uh, cars, festival use. Uh, so that looks pretty great. So let's look at what it actually ended up looking like. This was a celebration um, of finishing this project, which is very dramatic. Um, but this is how it looks, and it's, it's really incredible. Uh, and it ended up fostering, they parlayed an $11 million street investment into $271 million of private investment, attracting, and I want you to note the word local here. They didn't do this with Walmarts and giant big box stores. They attracted a lot of new local retailers and funky one-of-a-kind businesses and new infill construction projects, uh, and it's been a huge success. So that is a really dramatic example of how you uh, can completely change the street environment, uh, and that will shift the kinds of things that you can do on the street. One of the things I really see here in your region is people think, oh, we can have that and a 55 mile an hour traffic flow. Um, and I'm really here to say that that is not possible. You're not going to have that. So uh, the next examples that I want to give you come from uh, Ian Lockwood at, at, at AECOM, and he used to be the head of transportation in West Palm Beach, and he also um, is so generous in sharing some of these before and after pictures from his work there, and they're pretty dramatic. So um, areas of West Palm Beach that he tackled had a lot of difficulties. There were areas where in urban renewal, they'd stripped out all their buildings for parking. Um, they had a lot of um, vacant structures. Um, um, underinvested buildings, uh, poorly performing buildings, um, a lot of rough areas that they were trying to tackle. And Ian really took the approach that he could start tackling it by working from the streets outward. And he did that in residential districts that were tough and, and um, you know, really hurt by crime, and he did it in commercial districts as well. Uh, so this is, I believe, a commercial district. It runs along the waterfront, um, and he really feels that waterfront property should be, you know, fantastic and meandering to walk along. So uh, they took that from four lanes down to two lanes, and all of a sudden they got a whole bunch more people investing just even in their existing infrastructure in this neighborhood. Uh, this is another, it was a state road. They went from five lanes down to two lanes, so here's the before. Uh, and again, this is a residential district. And after these projects, in each case, um, just investment in, in the area and what was existing there started to shift really, really dramatically. Um, this is a lane narrowing and, and optical narrowing and creating um, those kind of environments where it's a shared streetscape. Really, really dramatic changes that really reshaped these districts. I just love these before and afters. He's a super, he's amazing at what he does and he's very generous to share all these. And I wish I could share some of these uh, with you from Portland, but we don't really have any dramatic stories like this with arterials. 
So one of the things I want you to notice is how often he, he's doing a lot of one-way to two-way, and he's doing a lot of getting rid of turn lanes, uh, and he's doing a lot of lane narrowing. So these are really true, pretty dramatic road dieting. In this district, he said, you know, a lot of these were vacant buildings that nobody was in, and after they started to change the street, and it's not even finished here, uh, people began leasing or renovating these buildings that have been existing for a long time. This is the most dramatic one. This is... Um, it was a vacant school, completely crime-ridden area, and they wanted to create a true mixed-use environment here that I hear a lot of people say they want to create in some of your corridors, uh, but I want you to notice what the street looks like, and you're, you're going to die at this after picture. <laughs> this is the school in the background, okay? So it's, it's the exact same perspective. But I want you to notice this street. There's no turn lanes. It's a two-lane road. One of the things I've noticed that you guys do when you want to create a main street is you put a median down the center. So median down the center is really great when you're trying to slow down a 55-mile-an-hour arterial. That is not what a main street is. Uh, and he had a huge argument with his traffic uh, engineers about putting a left turn lane in here because they're like, traffic is going to back up and you can't turn left. And he's like, you know what? It's going to be so great. People won't care if they have to sit there and wait to turn left. The other interesting story was is they had a little circulator going around this area, and it's hot in West Palm Beach, and it was an air-conditioned bus, and nobody rode it. So they turned it into a cute little trolley bus that was open air, and everybody rode it all the time. So these small little details actually make a really big difference. So I think these are great examples and dramatic examples, and we don't have enough of them from around the country of what you can do if you're going to change it. Um, but if you're not going to change it, like this. So just putting a median down the center is not changing it. Not having on-street parking uh, is not changing it. Then you're going to have to think about leveraging it and how do you tackle that. And that is what I'm going to spend the rest of my time here today talking about. Um, so... When you choose, and it is a choice, to have a street like Folsom Boulevard with a speed limit of 45 miles an hour and no on-street parking, there are a subset of uses that can succeed there. Um, I have to say, as a side note on Folsom Boulevard, I don't really understand why you build a freeway bypass right next to it, and then you keep Folsom Boulevard as sort of a sub-freeway. Um, so that was an opportunity to take a road and really change it and, and make it a neighborhood-serving road, since you had just built a freeway to increase uh, that capacity in, in that direction. Uh, so one of the things you have to really think about in, in that environment is who can be successful. Uh, Michael Friedman uh, is, is very astute when he says that you have to uh, really work backwards from this idea of who can succeed there. And for your corners, um, it's no surprise. It's, it's big retail and really understanding these different kinds of retail centers that can succeed mostly on your intersections in those environments is important. Uh, and I don't really need to talk about most of that here today because you guys have a lot of examples of that here. So the trick is, is what do you do with everything in between? And, and there's a lot of in-between here. Uh, and in order to have you know, some other option than sort of just a long arterial with a ragtag collection of underinvested buildings, uh, this is the big problem facing not just your region, but, but pretty much every major city in the country. So we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of working within this existing fabric and how you tackle it. And these are some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. And there's actually like a little extra one. I'm going to leave you with some final thoughts as well. Um, the, the secret checkbox that's not up there. So the thing I want to start talking about today is, is retail. And I want to start talking about retail because retail and restaurant and kind of outward facing entertainment are the lifeblood of places. Um, these are the things that bring activity and excitement and identity to a place. This is the place that we want to hang out. Um, we don't actually ever say, hey, let's go have lunch by all those dentist offices. Right? We, we don't um, think about the identity of places that don't have outward facing uses that we connect with emotionally. They become invisible to us, actually. Um, so retail is actually key to the entire placemaking ecosystem. Uh, people want to live and work near amenities. And because it's so important, I'm going to just talk about some general things about retail that I want you to have in the back of your head as we move through this. Uh, one of the first things that I want to talk about is the future of retail. Uh, one of the f first things people ask me when I go into an underperforming district is, Michelle, is retail going away? 
Uh, and my answer is always no, it is not. Uh, but it is going to change, and it always has changed. So back at the turn of the century, we used to get our eggs delivered. We used to get our milk delivered. We used to get a lot of stuff delivered from stores that were in town. And you could buy a house from the Sears catalog, which I still think is really, really cool. I wish I could buy a house from Amazon, and I think that's probably someday going to happen. Um, after the war, things really shifted in terms of retail. And what I like to say is, it's like we all became our own delivery vehicle. So we went from a pretty efficient system of a store had a truck and took it around to everybody to we all became our own truck. And we drove around to all of our own retail stores. Um, now, we're kind of going back in some ways to the way things used to be. Commodities, more and more, are going to be delivered to us. It may not be with the cute delivery truck. It may be the UPS man, um, who may be cute. Um, but um, it is shifting, but in some ways it's going back to the way that it was. And what we're looking for today is experience from retail. We want an experience when we go to a brick and mortar store. And that actually brings me to the next thing that I'm going to talk about is the brick and mortar experience. And Apple is a great example to talk about this with. Where does Apple have most of their sales? Where do they occur? Online. Vast majority of their sales are online. Why do they have a store? <laughs> For the, the genius bar? Experience, for a multi-sensory experience for people to experience the brand. So you can touch, you can feel, you can, you can talk to people. It's an, it's an interactive, multi-sensory experience. And it is where you go um, to, to really interact with the brand that is Apple. And that is really the direction that retail is going um, as a whole. Uh, so really what we're looking for in brick and mortar is to build relationship. People are looking not for commodities, but for a great time. Uh, for general retailers, that means that you have to really step up your merchandising game. Uh, this is one of my favorite stores. She's a serial entrepreneur. She's opened stores throughout the Pacific Northwest. She sells new and used everything. Uh, being in her store is a distinct experience. Whether you like her store or not is a different issue. Her store is a distinct experience that sort of feels like being in a foreign bazaar or marketplace. Everything you see is for sale. The fixtures, the lights, everything is for sale. And that means that it's always changing and shifting. And she says about her store, when people walk in my store, if they do one lap and they leave, I get up and I change everything around because you can't possibly walk through my store one time and see everything. And that is what retail environments are going to have to be like. To point this out, I love to say she took a light fixture and she covered it in live moss. And she occasionally, it's, it's dormant now, so she'll occasionally get up on a ladder and spritz it and it will come back to life. But you're not going to experience that in any other store in the United States. That is what people want out of retail. And I think that idea of the experience that she's constantly trying to provide in the store um, uh, is really profound, and it has a lot of applications for everybody. Uh, so to be successful, retailers have to take advantage, not just of the brick and mortar environment in their store, but the ecosystem uh, that exists uh, throughout the store. So by extension, environments are going to have to think about experience as well. So that's the second thing I wanted to talk about with retail. The third thing that I wanted to talk about with retail is that we are massively over-retailed. So between the suburban expansion in this country of retail and then the massive urban revitalization we've been experiencing over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, we've added a massive amount of retail space to this country. It's actually hard to do the calculation because we have mall people who track mall space and then we have a lot of in-city retail that nobody really exactly tracks. But roughly, we have two times the retail space per capita of our closest competitors, which are UK and Canada. And we have 20 times per capita the retail of places like Mexico and India. We have too much retail, period. Uh, so that means two things. Uh, the first thing that it means is that cities need to realize that retail zoning is not magic. Okay, So if you are not adding a bunch of new spending dollars to your region, but you're expanding your retail zoning, you are cannibalizing your existing retail infrastructure, period. There is just no escaping that. Unless you are adding new spending dollars, 
you, you can't add retail zoning without cannibalizing your existing retail infrastructure. The second thing that it means is that this is a highly competitive game in the United States. And if you're going to be successful, you can't phone it in. You're going to have to create a great experience. And that is getting exacerbated um, more and more. So those are things I want you to keep in the back of your head about retail because, like I said, experience is, is really the fundamental building block of placemaking. And you guys talk a lot about wanting to placemake on your arterials. Um, so you're going to be able to keep some of those, those lessons in your head as, as we walk through kind of the next sections. So the next thing I want to talk about is identity on arterials, which is a little bit of an oxymoron. Uh, because if you think about it, our commercial districts always used to reflect who we were and our personalities. That idea, they, they were a reflection of our identity. And what's fascinating about arterial, particularly national level um, uh, retail, is that it doesn't reflect the community that it's in at all usually. Typically, there's zero reflection. You could take a picture of most arterial retail, um, and you wouldn't know if it was an arterial in Georgia or an arterial in Ohio or an arterial in Sacramento. They do not reflect the identity of their communities. Um, so I'm going to talk about when you have a difficult arterial environment, how do you start looking at some of those things and trying uh, to get some reflection of the community back into that as a part of revitalization. Uh, so there are three things that I look at in terms of identity. I don't actually start with the site that I'm looking at first or the problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, I start by looking at sectional identity and then uh, focusing in. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about sectional identity. And I'm going to use as an example, we have Highway 99 that goes north-south through Portland. And I'm going to look at a northern section of that. Uh, I've done different kinds of work on, on northeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Um, and one of the first things I did is, is kind of divide it into sections. And all arterials have different personalities. And they can uh, be reflected by the types of businesses that are there, by different infrastructure things, by geographic. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that, that they break up. Uh, this corridor has a section that's, that feels very industrial. And it has a lot of uses that look like this. It has a section that I call the streetcar era section. A lot of this street, sadly, used to look like this. Uh, big chunks of it and most of it has been torn down. But there are, including this building, sections that still remain. So I call that the streetcar section. Uh, there's a section that looks a lot like any of your arterials, and I call this the suburban <laughs> arterial section. Uh, and you wouldn't know, is this, you know, where is this? This could be anywhere in the United States. Uh, and then the extreme northern section, where you can really see residential close to the street, I call actually small town arterial, because that's what it feels like to me. Um, so those are kind of roughly how I break down sections. And that informs how I might tackle tenanting and how I might tackle design. If somebody came to me and said, hey, I want to start introducing more density into this district, um, the first thing I'm going to say is, well, I'm looking for places where buildings are built right next to each other, right up to the sidewalk, because that's where density, that's how it works, right? So I would go back to the streetcar era section. I wouldn't try and start that somewhere else. If somebody said to me, we got to fix this industrial or we want to upgrade this, then I'm going to start looking at that from uh, a creative industrial perspective or an interesting outward facing kind of showroom uh, manufacturing, artisanal manufacturing uh, kind of piece. So those are ways I might take a sectional identity and start bringing down how I might tenant and design for that. And I'm going to give some more concrete examples of that a little bit later. So once I have an idea of the section that I'm working in, then I want to understand kind of the context, not just the street, but sort of the broader context of that section. And I want to look at demographics. You know, is it a lot of young people? Is it older people? What kind of cultural diversity do I have? What kind of employment is there? But I really want to look deeper than that. And I want to understand um, what they're about, how they see themselves, what other themes and vertical markets surround this area, not just on um, uh, the street. Is it an agricultural area? Did it used to be an agricultural area? Is it an entertainment district? Is there a lot of interesting light manufacturing? I'm looking for things that I can interconnect here and reflect authentically back out onto the arterial. So I'm going to give you an example, actually, from Rancho Cordova. So none of this is expressed on... Um, uh, Folsom Boulevard. But all around Rancho Cordova, there are an amazing array of home improvement businesses. Um, and there are interior designers, there are tile places, there are granite places, there are plumbing places. Those things are really visually compelling. Uh, and those are things that I would like to bring into the street. So, oops, I just hit the wrong button. Presentation's over. Um, so, um, so what I would like to do, if, if I was tackling, revitalizing one of the larger, say, strip malls in uh, Rancho Cordova, 
is I would go out and I would get a collection of really cool landscapers and granite people and gazebo builders and all of those people. And I would put them in one of those big, giant, semi-empty strip malls. And then I would waive parking requirements and all of those things and any color requirements and anything. And I would say, go to town. I want you to make this building look amazing. And I want you to take this parking lot and I want you to turn it into a giant outdoor showroom for what you do. And I want you to imagine how great that would be to walk by. It would create actually an authentic and unique identity just for that section of Rancho Cordoba around being a design district. And it would start attracting a lot of other things like that right next door. Then all of a sudden, you have more possibility for doing some small infill and some other things around that. So that's an example of how you might take contextual identity into account. Is this inside or outside? It's hard to tell, though, isn't it? It's, it's outside. It's just next to a warehouse um, on a sidewalk. But she's created a little tiny outdoor room there. You can do amazing things um, with these kinds of tenants. Um, <clears throat> So, so I guess, you know, to go back to this idea of contextual identity, I want to understand, you know, with an idea like that, what can be successful in a corridor of people driving 45 miles an hour, which, which a design district idea could. Um, I want to do it in a way that reflects the authentic identity already in place in the district, which it does. Um, and I want to do it in a way so that everybody driving by gets a sense of, hey, here's what we're about in Rancho Cordova, which it does. Our arterials reflect zero identity now. And I, one of the ways you have to think about uh, revitalizing, uh, revitalizing these corridors is finding ways um, to get that identity to be reflected authentically on the street. Um, I want to give you an example of how that idea of ethos um, is reflected in tenanting. Uh, this is kind of a luxury to be able to tenant this way, but it, it's sort of a funny story from Portland. So I've been in a lot of neighborhood meetings in Portland where you're kind of going out and you're talking about what do you want to see with this development or what do you want to be, see on the street? Um, uh, maybe an area is changing. And in Portland, you'll get about 45 minutes of we do not absolutely under no circumstances want to see a national chain, period. Don't even say national chain. Um, uh, and, and so you've worked through that for quite a bit of time, and you finally get to a point of you're like, okay, but you know, well, well, let's talk about what you might want. And with a completely straight face, people will say, Trader Joe's. <laughs> And you know, you you hesitate to say, well, that is a national chain, but um, they don't care because Trader Joe's reflects their authentic identity and how they see themselves. And so, when you tap into the authentic ethos of a district, it's much easier to quickly build identity and relationship and connection. So that is an example of how powerful that can be because there is not a force much more powerful than the anti-chain sentiment in Portland. So um, it, it's also a testament to the brown power of Trader Joe's. Now, just to show you um, that any building can contribute to a pretty fantastic environment, here is the before picture of that Trader Joe's. So don't tell me you can't take your existing arterial infrastructure and make it fantastic, because you can't. And I'm going to show you more examples today. So after I've done some contextual identity building, then I finally start looking at kind of the site specifically and thinking about um, what, what, I, what I want to do there. And, and again, I'm really looking at, I want to understand the experience this whole site is providing. Um, so what is it saying about itself on the exterior? What story is it telling? Uh, what can I tell about this development and the businesses that are going to go into it when I'm driving by, when I'm walking by, when it's open, when it's closed? All of those things. What's noteworthy? What's interesting? I want to know all of those things. So your story story starts, starts long before you get in the store. That is a lesson that has been forgotten by suburban retailers and arterial developers. Um, everyone pretends like everything is invisible until you walk through the doors. And that needs to change because it's creating a horrible experience on your street, on your sidewalks, in the parking lot. Um, that needs to change. So I want to give you an example of this. Um, and it, it's actually an Apple example again. They were going to put a store in in Chicago in this little triangle. And the only thing on that triangle was a really run down um, a transit station that had a vacated bus mall. So Apple said, well, you know, we're a pretty big draw, 
But what people experience on the way to our store is just as important as what they experience in our store. So they paid $4 million for the rights to renovate the transit center next to the Apple store and to make a really cool plaza out of the vacated bus mall next to it because they knew that the experience getting to the store was just as important as the experience once you were in the store. So um, contextual identity is, is very, very important, and I want people to be thinking about that more as they're thinking about how to tackle. So the, uh, I want to say throughout all, all of this, this idea of identity is you can create nodes of identity kind of nearly anywhere. So here's an arterial intersection. Anyone have any idea where it is? Huh? Anywhere. Yes, right. You do, that, that's the punchline. You, who, exactly. So it's in Phoenix. Uh, and so here on the corner is just a little... Um, strip mall, and it's an earlier strip mall, it's small, um, and what they did is they took it, they renovated it, they painted it a great color, they made it look fantastic at night, and they curated the tenants so that there was a boutique grocery, a pizzeria, a bakery, a gelato place, and a paper art store, and it's now so popular that it has valet parking in their little strip mall parking lot. You can create a node of activity anywhere, uh, but it may have to start small. So that leads me to the next thing that I'm going to talk about, which is creating connectivity. So you're working within existing fabrics, and you're taking threads of things, and you're trying to weave them together into kind of a cohesive picture. This is not like greenfield development, where you draw happy lines and say, this is where retail will be, and this is where residential will be. You're trying to work within things that are already there. Um, so when I'm thinking about connectivity, I, I care about this, and, and I'm you know a little bit mercenary at heart, because it really comes down to economics. Our most valuable places right now in the United States are the ones that are connected and walkable per square foot. That's the truth. Um, and in the next few decades, that's going to be true as well, whether you're in a small town, whether you're in a suburban uh, center, or whether you're in a downtown. Interconnected and walkable infrastructure is going to be our most uh, valuable per square foot. So I'm looking at two things, physical adjacencies and emotional adjacencies. <clears throat> the physical adjacencies are what we're going to start with because they're a little easier. Um, and, and these are uh, you know, pretty natural. I'm going to talk about uh, a couple different ones. Engaging your edges. Uh, permeability is one of those things. I'm going to give an example from downtown Vancouver, Washington. They had a park uh, in their downtown, and it was um, uh, a pretty... I think, scary place at the time. I didn't experience uh, this park when it had not been renovated. But people tell me that it was uh, a center for a lot of drug dealing and a lot of crime, and everyone in the city really avoided it. And the city did an amazing job of banding together and renovating this park and attracting a Hilton and a convention center, which is directly across from the park. So you have this, this amazing development that happens here. They have an incredible historic Main Street, and this is one of our oldest cities um, in the West Coast, and they have this great historic Main Street that's two blocks from this park. So I think of downtowns as like stores a lot. So they've created this best-selling product, right? This is the milk of downtown. And um, so what did they do with this lot? Did they think about how to interconnect um, and, and permeability? No. They built this, which was like a giant wall blocking their Main Street from this fantastic product that they just created in their downtown. Um, and there's really like no sight line of visibility to that from the Main Street, and it's created a little bit of a dead place here. So permeability in these environments is really important. I noticed on, on Folsom in Rancho Cordova, as you look to the north of Folsom, um, it looks like there were a lot of roads that used to go down and connect to Folsom that over the years have been cut off. Uh, so that is decreasing permeability, which is actually bad. It creates more traffic congestion and problems on Folsom Boulevard. So permeability is a big one that I'm looking for. Um, incorporating your edges. If you have something interesting along the edge of a, a development or even something that's not interesting, figure out how to connect with it. Um, an interesting example would be if you have a park, put some restaurants with outdoor seating next to it. Maybe less interesting is a bus stop. But they incorporated it into the edge of this strip mall um, uh, parking development. So it, it looked great and it created uh, connectivity. Connectivity can be big and small. You want to welcome all travelers of all different different kinds. Um, this is a medical center, and this is their parking lot. And this is a long walk in from uh, the sidewalk. But it's pretty engaging, and it's sending a very positive message for both people in the parking lot and for pedestrians, that pedestrians are a valued mode of transportation. This is another example. And this is from the same place that that bus stop example I just showed you. This is the walkway to the strip mall. And this strip mall parking lot also contains, it's just over here, I should have included a picture of it, um, an outdoor seating area for a restaurant that in Portland 
time was restaurant of the year. Your parking lots can be huge amenities if you let them. Uh, this is a, a walkway from the sidewalk to a building through a parking lot that is incredibly multimodal. And in fact, so much so that when you're driving over this little thing, you have a little bit of a sense of, I'm not sure if I can even drive here, which is good because you're sending a message that we welcome everybody. Uh, and this is a, a bench art plant installation in a parking space. Uh, but it's a great message to say that our streets and our sidewalks, these are all public spaces and we're using them and we're sharing them together. So there are a lot of ways to create uh, connectivity along our edges that can be exciting. Uh, another one has to do with your streets. They're connecting everything, and they're you know along the edge of a lot of the things that we're trying to improve. So improving the street and making it look better has an impact. This is uh, a rural town. This is Cornelius, Oregon. Uh, this is a long time ago. This is after uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation got a hold of uh, the town center and put a one-way couplet state highway through the middle. Uh, and this is part of the couplet. Uh, a lot of it doesn't have a sidewalk, and some of it does, and then it ends. Um, this is the other side of the couplet where they did a bunch of street improvements and they built this new medical center, which I had just showed you a picture of the walkway on the other side. Uh, and it's really transformed the way that people even think about their community, um, these dramatic street improvements. So improving the street is really important. The other thing I want to talk about with connectivity is connecting nodes. This is something that we definitely don't do enough in the suburbs in terms of um, uh, figuring out how to weave together that fabric. The uh, and again, I care about this because the places that are most connected and walkable are the ones that will be the most valuable over the next few decades. So I'm going to give you an example of, of how not to do it, actually. And this comes from uh, the city of Gresham. It's the fourth largest city in Oregon. And they actually have a really cute little downtown here. And uh, super charming. It's got a little street grid and houses and residential all around it. It's uh, pretty strong residentially. It's supported a couple of uh, new residential buildings. Um, so just like all of these places, after World War II, it, it started to decline. So what did the city do? Can anybody guess? They built them all, almost as good. And they built them all right next to it. Uh, so what have they done? Well, um, well, let's go back. So they, we have all this grid, urch, it all stops, nothing goes out to the street anymore. And they put the back of the mall to the downtown. Right, so did that help downtown at all? I mean, they're still trying to figure out how to recover from this thing. Okay, so fast forward several decades. Um, this mall, it still cash flows. It's owned by a REIT, as malls are. And, uh, but it's not uh, really a fantastic neighborhood amenity or doing really fantastically. So what did they do? They built another mall. And they built it right next to the last mall. Uh, so this mall is actually on the light rail station. So they brought light rail through here instead of the stop being in downtown, which makes me incredibly sad. And they did build some you know, pretty nice Todd housing right around this. And it is completely disconnected from anything else around here. It is not walkable. You don't want to interact with it. It's confusing to the car. There is no. So it is not going to, if you build something, you want it to be interconnected so it makes somebody else want to build something next to it. So this is what the entire walk is like from that train station to try to get to downtown. This is a tiny section of it, but it, it's, it's, it's just this, and it's horrible. It's one of the worst walks I've ever taken, and I take this walk a lot when I was working here, and every time I took it, I was like, there is not a good, I took all these different, like, I'm going to go this way this time, maybe it's a little better. They're all horrible, and so they've lost an opportunity in that train station because they didn't interconnect any of this stuff. Um, they could have used that Todd development if it had been interconnected appropriately to um, continue to encourage that kind of form around it. So uh, connecting your nodes is really, really important. And then hiding parking, and that's an obvious one. Um, and I'm going to show a couple examples of that. And this is also around uh, train. This is Gresham is the extreme east of our metropolitan region, and this is Hillsborough, which is extreme west. And these are along the edges of our urban growth boundaries. Um, so Hillsboro, uh, this is their train stop. So you notice we have a big arterial here, and the train stop's actually back here. And uh, what's interesting about how this developed is the commercial developed around the street first, not around the train stop. And the residential uh, developed around the train stop first. 
And so this is the arterial. And they purposely worked with a Renko station in multiple phases, you know, slowly in small bites. That's something I really want to stress. Um, to introduce more traditional kind of mall development, but in a way that incorporated housing, that ha hid the parking, uh, and that made a, a pretty attractive environment on the street. So you can see this is a wide street. Over here, where there's a lot of residential and no commercial on the ground floor, there is a sidewalk, but it is separated from the street. That's, that's a component of making this successful in this environment. All of this commercial over here is ground floor commercial. They made it compelling from the ground floor. It looks nice. Um, residential up top. Um, but you drive in, um, and then you know there's a huge swath of parking behind it. But these have been pretty successful and absorbed really well in these communities. Um, but it's been slow. And what's been interesting in this development over time is it's gotten more and more dense. I want to give you another example of, of retrofitting this kind of thing. This is Mashpee Common. Some of you may be familiar with this exa example from Massachusetts. <clears throat> Traditional strip mall, loads of parking, town of 12,000, no center, um, suburban community in New England. Uh, this was the site. This was the original site. Huge sea of parking. And they gridded it into small grids with little two-way streets, no medians in the middle of them. And, um, and they still have parking that surrounds it. But this has become a little town center. And this is all new construction that they've put in here. Uh, and they've made it really charming. And it's been very successful. And they have a mix of local tenants, uh, civic uses, residents, and, and national tenants. And it's been a really successful development. Uh, and again, they hid the the parking along the edges of it. If your district becomes high enough rent, and this is one of the challenges, it's hard to hide parking. It's expensive to hide parking. Um, this is one of our high income suburbs in Portland, Lake Oswego, and they did a project in along the edge of an arterial in their downtown um, where they built a public private partnership garage here in the middle and they wrapped it by office and uh, retail development. And you can see the pictures of that here. And it's, it's really pretty nicely done. This is the entryway to the parking garage. There's a fireplace. And when you drive on this, I, and again, the first time I drove on it, I actually had a panic attack that I was driving on a restaurant plaza and that I was going to be you know, busted and arrested for driving in a pedestrian way. So it very naturally you know, calms the traffic and, and sends the message. This is a very much a pedestrian shared space that people feel comfortable walking and not driving on so much. But it's been a very successful development in downtown Lake Oswego. So those are examples of uh, physical adjacencies that I'm always kind of thinking of. But just as important are emotional adjacencies, and these are things that are entirely absent, uh, usually in the arterial environment. So let's look, look at some examples of those. That medical uh, center that I told you about, they, they this walkway, they have community gardens on one side in the parking lot. So they're creating an emotional adjacency. Um, to their building uh, by using their parking lot for an alternate use. Um, the, the town of Lake Oswego, all along their arterial and into the downtown, they've created a sculpture art walk. So you can go throughout this district and in the most surprising places be sprinkled around the town are a series of sculptures. And you... Um, can download an iPhone app and go on a museum tour of these sculptures. And it's really, really fantastic. So it's a way of interconnecting this community, community uh, very effectively. I love these little neighborhood lending libraries. Neighborhoods that have a network of these uh, throughout a district are telling a fantastic story and creating, uh, again, emotional adjacencies and connection and relationship and identity within a district. So these are a wonderful example of that. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the beer bike in Portland. And this is what people ride on to go um, tour all the microbreweries downtown. And so visually, this is creating, I mean, the second you see this, you think of Portland breweries. When you see a bunch of people on this bike, and it's hilarious because they're all pedaling like mad, but it goes super slowly. Um, <laughs> it's really cute. <laughs> They're working off that beer. We're getting ready for the next one. So, um, uh, you know, this is creating so many emotional adjacencies between things that are not directly connected, but it is interconnecting them uh, really, really effectively. Uh, and then finding ways to connect your vertical markets. So um, I worked in a downtown once, and it was a small downtown, and it had this unlikely, it had a jewelry store, a wedding planner, um, uh, a stationary store, and it had one of the largest ballroom dance floors west of the Mississippi. 
So there's a little wedding vertical market thing going there. None of those people were talking to each other in this little downtown. But that is totally a vertical market theme that they could have started creating a whole bunch of emotional adjacencies around in their downtown, whether it was, you know, wedding event work, bringing in a wedding dress store, you know, a whole mix of things. So those are examples of ways that you might want to tackle um, building emotional adjacencies. So the next thing that I want to talk about is pedestrian dialogue. And it ties into emotional adjacencies uh, a little bit. So um, I always want to know, and I'm actually going to pause on this slide. I, I told this story yesterday. So I was speaking to a really, um, what most people would think would be a dry group. I was speaking to the, uh, I always forget this acronym, Pacific Intermountain Parking and Transportation Association about transportation and how it impacts um, livable environments. And I'm up there giving this presentation, and this slide came up, and you know I'm like in full swing. I'm like right in my, my groove. And uh, this slide comes up, and this guy in the front raises his hand. He's like, ooh. And, and so I was really kind of, I have to say on the inside, I was a little irritated, because I was like, I'm doing my thing. Man, you're interrupting me. And, uh, but I, I stopped, and I, I called him, and I said, yes. And he said, I bought my watch there. And I thought, that is so amazing that he loved this store so much that he had to interrupt my presentation to share that with everybody, right? That is making an emotional connection. And, and, and so it's just such a great example of that. So uh, sidewalk dialogue. And I, and I love this slide for that reason before then. But after he told that story, um, now I, I use it all the time. Uh, it's also a great example, too, because it's a below-grade store. So it's really hard to get people to leave the sidewalk and go down or go up for retail. And, and they do a, a, a very good job of it. So I'm always looking on the ground floor for what kind of identity. This is a pullback shot from that one I asked you, whether it was inside or outside. Uh, so I always want to know what conversation people are having with pedestrians because we love the places that are talking to us and that means those places have higher sales per square foot. Um, so what kind of conversations are your developments having with pedestrians, whether it's internally within a strip mall or whether it's a sidewalk on the street? Can anybody guess what this use is? It is a hotel. It's on a street in Tacoma that is not a particularly vibrant uh, retail street. And it's fantastic. So Tacoma is the home of Dale Chihuly. And they have a glass museum there. And they rebranded this uh, hotel around glass. And they have a big glass installation here. There's fire going outside all the time. So you can feel it when you walk by. And you can hear the flames flickering. So it starts to engage different senses. They pipe in music. Music makes us happy. Um, and uh, you can sit in one of these chairs and the wind's kind of blowing in your hair and you feel the heat and the music's playing and you're looking at this gigantic green glass thing and the sun is shining in through it. And you are having an experience that tells you everything about what this hotel wants you to know before you have set foot in the hotel. The retail experience starts before you get in the door. That is so important to remember. And so the pedestrian dialogue that you're having is a really important component of that. So let's look at that for some different uses. What is this? It's in a strip mall. It's a Starbucks. Yeah, Starbucks. So this Starbucks had been renovated, really fancy strip mall renovation. Uh, it looks great. And I used to go there once a week when I dropped my daughter off for Spanish tutoring. So I show up you know, on this day. And I'm, I'm a geek. So I, I noticed this right away. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? And there's a little bench right here. And I sat on that bench for an hour. And I watched people walk up to this thing and freak out. So this is their neighborhood Starbucks. And they would walk up to this corner. And they would look left at this door really nervously. And then they would look right at this door. And they're like, oh my god, I don't know where to go. And is this even a Starbucks anymore? And then they would look up. And they, they'd lean back, because they were kind of right under the door. And they, would, they were just lost. So there's this really fancy, curved wooden piece here in the center. And you know what they would do? They would follow that right into a wall. Thunk. <laughs> and so they had to put a plant there to stop people from doing that. So I came back the next week, and they had put out tables, and there was somebody walking in the door. It's a huge difference, isn't it? It's not the fancy siding. It's not the stuff that they spent a fortune on, like the curved wood. and the, It's the really cheap umbrella and tables that are outside. So what is the best sign for a restaurant? Tables and chairs. Yeah, that's the best sign for a restaurant. And if you can have people in those tables and chairs, that is really the best sign for a restaurant.
But any use can be active and interesting and engaging to pedestrians. What is this? You'll get it after you look at it for a while. But when you first glance at it, it's a car wash. I would put this car wash in any downtown. This is the place to get your car washed in Miami. Okay, they built a little tiny building here that's super cute with a little restaurant in it for that captive audience of people waiting to get their car washed and they hid all the ugly car wash stuff behind some nice landscaping. Okay, this is fantastic. Anyone can have a conversation with pedestrians. Uh, service uses can do it. Can anybody guess what this is? <laughs> it's a medical center, it's a, it's a doctor's office. So what they did is, so, so how often have you seen a doctor's office with floor to ceiling windows? And never. Uh, so this is a great example of that. So they really activated the sidewalk front and the waiting room is all along the front here. So during the day when people are there, you see heads and people, which is what we want to see on the sidewalk. And they put gigantic murals depicting the history of this neighborhood. So at night when it's closed, it becomes a giant art exhibit that's really compelling. And then all of the treatment rooms run behind these murals in areas where you don't need windows because you want privacy. This is a great example of how any use can have a conversation um, with pedestrians. What is this? It's a bank. So this is a bank that rebranded itself. It's a regional bank. It's called Umqua. And they uh, really responded to a lot of the trends that are happening in banking, namely the one that we never go in banks anymore. We do it all from our computer. So you don't need giant branches. And they wanted to create a neighborhood bank environment. So this is actually looks like a living room. It is a living room. It is, you could go take your computer in there and work. You can schedule and hold meetings in this space. Along the window that you can't see here, they have computers set up. You can use it to access the internet. When you're in town, they pop popcorn in there and give it to people when they walk in. They uh, hold events at night after it's closed for the community. Anybody can use the space and they program the space themselves. Um, and this is what it looks like when it's closed. So I always want to know, what is your district saying? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's telling a story. So what story is it telling about you all the time? So this is telling a great story. Uh, and then obviously, retailers. I want to know what story retailers are telling. Uh, so I want to talk about you know, the impact that this can have even in a strip mall environment, a beige dated strip mall environment. Um, so here's one, this is from Lake Oswego, again, uh, along the arterial. And ironically, this strip mall had the best collection of pedestrian dialogue um, uh, as compared to their downtown. And it was really fun to walk around the strip mall. You don't notice it from the sidewalk, but once you're here, you are much more likely to go into these other stores uh, because of how they're having a conversation with the pedestrians uh, within that strip mall. So these are really, really powerful things. And I actually remember a whole bunch of the stores when I was doing my mapping project um, from walking around that. Now I'm gonna go back to this mall here, this example, and I, I'm gonna share with you um, uh, the power of this as well. So this is one of the anchor tenants in that mall now. It's a craft warehouse. And again, I was doing a, a mapping project that I do with these communities. And this um, store had a ton of pedestrian dialogue going on outside their store. And, and you know, I measure that. It's, it's really scientific by I'm taking photos and writing things on a map. And if I stop doing that and I touch one of those scarves, they're doing their job, right? They're doing their job. I cannot remember another store that's in this strip mall. Because this is what it looked like to the left, and this is what it looked like to the right. They have forgotten the experience starts way before you get in the door. So pedestrian dialogue is something <clears throat> you have to really think about in tenanting, in design. Uh, when you're um, trying to rebuild these places, you want to figure out the conversations that you're having with your pedestrians. So the last thing that I want to talk about reverts back to ugly boxes. So most people say, well, um, Michelle, we should just, what could I do with this horrible, ugly little building? We should just tear it down. There's nothing we can do with it. Uh, so I'm going to show you a bunch of examples um, uh, of how great ugly boxes are. They're really just blank canvases upon which you can project your vision. Uh, so this is not an ugly box, uh, but it was next to an ugly box. So one of Portland's leading uh, adaptive reuse developers uh, bought this building and uh, these two buildings. And you know, obviously the firehouse is really charming and 
kind of a no-brainer in terms of development. But this really ugly uh, garage building was next to it. And they really weren't sure what to do with it. And uh, you can see it's very attractive on the inside. And the middle support truss was sagging and had to be held up. And they, there's no market for uh, paid off-street parking. They just didn't really know what to do with it. So the architect went off and did a set of drawings for this building to save it, because he really felt like it could be a fantastic building. So here's the before, and here's the after. And it's the same building. And here's a before and after of that building. And this is what the inside look like, looks like. And the irony is that the contractor, who really thought, you know, maybe we should tear this down because it's, it's pretty bad, he now leases it as his office space. Okay, So it's really hard to have vision. And in these early stages in these districts, this is a great example of that. You're going to have to have vision. Some people are going to step up and have to have vision. After you have a few of these, people start to get it. But the first ones, you're going to have to have vision for other people. Um, this was one of the first. Uh, uh, buildings that were renovated on North Mississippi Avenue. Um, and that's where the, the, the tour that Mike was talking about. So not a lot of people look at this building and say, this is going to be um, a fantastic neighborhood uh, breakfast lunch joint. Uh, but that's exactly what it turned into. And this is not a fancy renovation. This is a $20, $30 square foot renovation, where you rip everything out, you expose the joists, you finish the concrete floors. Um, you know, The restaurant did their build out. But in terms of creating an attractive shell, um, it didn't cost a lot of money. This was another building we toured on North Mississippi Avenue. How many people would look at that and say, that could be a really charming mixed-use environment with a really active little public plaza in front? Well, that's exactly what it is, and that's what it looks like at night. Little side note, building lighting, very, very important. Street lighting is for cars. Building lighting is for people. Okay, so this is that whole development pulled back. So we were standing here before, uh, and this is the after picture. So we have live workspaces in the back, we have creative office upstairs, and then we have a whole mix of retail along the ground floor. So it's a really successful project. Um, this is, a, I love the little two by four holding up the awning. This was um, at a, a pretty dead intersection. It had a mix of uh, commercial infrastructure from different eras, a U-Haul uh, defunct gas station. Um, pretty dead corner. Uh, we wanted this to become a, a, a neighborhood gathering spot, very attractive on the inside, as you can tell. Um, and we turn it into a coffee shop. You know what? These early people get a very good rental rate. I actually own this building. And I knew that having a neighborhood gathering spot that reflected the community was really important. So we found that person, and we gave them a smoking deal um, in order to create that. This is now one of the hottest restaurant nodes in the city. And I'm not saying we're responsible for that, but it starts one small, ugly box at a time. And you build it slowly. And this is your after picture of the inside. Uh, this was a 1950s era auto um, uh, dealership. And this is a pizza parlor that's in a piece of that building now. It was divided up into a mix of buildings. Uh, this is a very attractive warehouse that belonged to a car dealership off of an arterial. And it was turned into a series of like 500 square foot micro restaurants. There's a before and after. This is closed. What story is that telling? It's telling a great story, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's going to reshape the things that go in around it. So you look at this and think, tear down. What could you possibly do with this building? This was actually owned by the same guy who owned the firehouse. And he lived in this neighborhood. So he was going to have to worry about being at the grocery store and hearing people complain about, um, you know, hey, What'd you do with that building? Um, so he spent a, a little money on this one. Um, but it's pretty amazing. This is the same building before and after. And so again, expose the roof joists, concrete floor. Um, it's just how you put a different face on it. It's a great empty box, actually. We look a lot at roof decks. So roof decks that are uh, sometimes from the 50s and 60s of this great tongue and groove, groove um, woodwork. And if you expose that, it just creates the warmest, most fantastic um, space. So those spaces can be really valuable. So you saw this before and after of the Trader Joe's, but this was actually a larger development that had a whole bunch of space that was not open and engaging to the street. And so they divided it up into uh, smaller spaces and outward facing, engaging. Uh, and this has a giant parking lot in front of it, and it's on an arterial. Uh, so there are no boxes that are too ugly to save. Uh, this is a before picture. It was the Oregon Food Bank. And then I think at one point it had some bicycle manufacturing going on in there. Uh, this is an after, same perspective. Uh, 
long buildings you want to break up with color, with some different elements coming out of the building. Um, this building, I'm going to go back just a couple slides. It was unusual because it's 100 feet deep and it's super long. And 100 feet is too deep for a small individual retail tenant. So uh, this property owner put a hallway about two thirds of the way through and he created these little small micro kind of office retail spaces with exposure onto that hallway um, in the back. And it, it created um, a really neat environment. And he took a few of those and took the roof off and daily lighted them into these little mini shared park spaces off the back. So it was a really creative project that's very, very popular. This is the building on that street. It's the same street that the last project was on. This street uh, was a high crime street, very toothy, lots of empty lots, few warehouses, few buildings here and there. This is North Williams Avenue. This is the first project that started it. It didn't start with a multi-acre, gigantic, zillions of square feet project. It started with this. Um, and this is what it looks like after, same corner. They didn't do anything to the building except for carved storefronts in it. A lot of these details were here. They're just highlighted with paint so you can actually see them. This is a production bakery and she has a retail storefront. The thing I want you to notice about a lot of these pictures is color. Color is the cheapest and easiest way to create vibrancy in a place. Economically underperforming places are almost uniformly beige. You can create color by painting buildings. You can create color by putting murals up and lighting them so they change at night in different ways. Uh, this is Director Park in downtown Portland that has a whole exterior light installation that changes color over time. And it's one of the places that's probably um, most interesting at night in the city. Do you have a place on your corridor that's really more interesting and engaging at night than it is during the day? These are things that you can think about, and color is a way to start introducing those things. So that is the end of kind of the, the body of what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to offer you um, some thoughts and observations based on the, the, the last three days that I've spent here related to these things. Uh, so the first one is think local. Um, national tenants are not going to bail you out of your corridor under-invested corridor problem. They're not. It's not going to happen. Um, so you're going to have to, you know, the national tenants follow income and educational attainment. And you keep moving that further and further out. Uh, and so they're just going to keep following that further and further out. And they're just going to leave you with all of this under-invested stuff in between. And you're going to have to figure out what to do with it. Uh, and so the people that you're going to have to look to are going to be the people in those communities. And you're going to have to figure out how to bring them to those streets and express who they are and what they do um, uh, back onto those corridors. And when you do that, you're going to have to probably do it starting with the reuse of existing buildings. The reason that that happened, every district in Portland, except for South Waterfront, which largely went bankrupt, um, started with the reuse of existing buildings. And that's how it works. Um, so you're going to have to look at your existing building stock, and you're going to have to figure out um, how to redevelop it cheaply. So in Portland, almost every district started to revitalize and get identity um, around existing buildings because you can adaptively reuse them more affordably and offer lower rents, which is what's appealing um, to your local tenant base. So existing or renovating buildings is going to be important. And creating um, a lexicon for that and a code base for that, all of those things are going to be important, uh, which is the next thing that I'm going to talk about, is you need to orient some policy around adaptive reuse and small infill. So I would suspect, and I haven't done a review of all of your, your, your code and policies and processes. But from what I've heard, um, they're designed for super huge national tenant mall developments of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of square feet. Um, and those kinds of fees and processes are not applicable to the kinds of small guerrilla projects that you're going to have to do in these districts. And you're going to have to figure that out. You have to figure out how to make the adaptive reuse of these buildings uh, affordable and accessible for people. So for instance, if I am in a culturally diverse area and I've got a strip mall building that's about eight or 9,000 square feet, what I would want to do with that is go out and find the best five ethnic restaurants representing the people who live around there and create a really fantastic restaurant node. And I'm guessing that just the fees for each of those individual restaurants would make that almost impossible to happen. So you're going to have to think about, from a policy perspective, how you facilitate those kinds of uses. And that's going to require building relationships. So national credit tenanting is a very different, and building of that scale is really, really different. So this requires, and we really saw that in a lot of the meetings that we had this week. It was so much fun to bring these disparate people together um, and find out and start to even just tap into through these conversations all of the capacity 
um, that is in these communities to start potentially revitalizing these corridors. There are amazing people out there doing amazing things in these communities. How do you bring that out and express that in your district? It's going to require building relationships and doing some handholding for initial projects. And then the last thing is that you're going to have to be flexible and creative. There is no escaping this. There's no cookie cutter way for you guys to start doing this. You're going to have to think outside the box um, and you're going to have to be flexible in how you do things and creative uh, in terms of looking at them. So that is the uh, end of my presentation today and I'm happy to take questions as we have time. I don't get to sit down yet. Um, so uh, I'm a big fan of on-street parking in all forms, in all environments. Um, so on-street parking says a couple different things. It naturally slows traffic down because it creates friction, which is generally good for the retail environment. Um, but for pedestrians, it, it also just creates a buffer from traffic and that makes us more comfortable. So I like it for that reason. It also sends the message, it's kind of funny, I mean, if people are parking in off-street parking, it sends the message when you're driving through that people are going to things there and when you see people pulling in and out. So it, it sort of sends this, this cue of this is a place that people stop and this is a place that people are going. So just because you hide your off-street parking does not mean you eliminate your on-street parking. Any other questions? Yes. Science. They talk a little bit about science because you know, we're not very big and we'll be big to just suddenly carry on. Uh, so I actually, I think the arterial retail environment has made us really lazy because I actually, um, I think signs make you lazy. I think that this is how I tell retailers they should think about signs is I think that you should really understand what you do in your store. Then you should make sure your building reflects everything that you're about and what you do and who you are. Then I think your windows need to reflect your building and the experience you're gonna provide when people go in. And then the whole area outside your store needs to tell those things as well. And after you do all of that, then you can think about a sign. And what's interesting is, is usually if you do all that really well, you don't need a sign. So Rancho Cordova is really interesting. It has an area that has um, uh, a bunch of recreation stuff for kids. So there's an indoor pool, there's a trampoline place, there's, a, um, there, there's this whole series of things that are clustered around this node uh, that is entirely visible off of Folsom Boulevard. And a bunch of people at the table when we had our meeting were like, I had no idea that was there. Any story that you can tell about being a family friendly place, what does that say about your neighborhood? What does that say about the community you're in? What does that say about, so you're missing this huge opportunity in that whole development because it's inside the doors. I mean, if you could have some windows and see kids trampolining, that would be awesome. If you had a play structure outside, what are the ways, they, they don't need a sign, they need to show what they're doing and what's there. So, so you know, in creative writing, they have that saying, show, don't tell. So, so if you're writing a story about Bob and he's happy, you don't say Bob is happy, you say Bob jump for joy, right? So it's the same thing with these environments. How do you show? Signs tell. And you know what? Um, we were in Elk Grove, and everyone's like, nobody knows where our parking is, and we have all these signs. And then we made bigger signs, and nobody, we don't have much time to really process signs. Um, the only time we really look at signs and understand that they're there is when we're specifically looking for a business, uh, and we know where we're going. But this idea that the sign is introducing your business to people and telling them what's there and what you're about is entirely false. So that's how I feel about signs. Mm -hmm. Short of costly underground, can you address power lines and all the clutter? Yeah, so you know, clutter is a funny thing. There's absolutely nothing that is drawing your eye away from that on your arterial environment, so you notice it. Um, if you go to a street that has a really active street presence and a lot of stuff going on and pedestrian dialogue, that's what you look at. So the bottom 20 feet is where a district gets its identity. I don't care if I'm in Manhattan uh, or somewhere else. This is what we experience, bottom 20 or 30 feet. That's where we think about the identity of a district. If there's nothing there, you know, then I'm just like, whoa, there's a lot of stuff there. So you'd be amazed at if you start creating a conversation lower down 
people won't notice those things. And there are different environments where people will talk about clutter of A-frame signs or clutter of utility poles or other kinds of things. And the funny thing is, is if you go to districts that have great um, pedestrian and ground floor activity, um, you don't notice them as much. So they're not hampering you to the degree that you think. That's not stopping um, great things from happening on the, on, on the arterials. Although it's fantastic if you can bury them, obviously you don't have the funds to do it in most of these locations. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, no, but I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting idea. I haven't, I mean, I've seen outdoor space that people have used for events, but they haven't built, you know, kind of a shell to really improve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting idea. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. I'll, I'll share an idea I had. Um, so Elk Grove, you know, everyone was, they have the train comes through and it stops traffic. And uh, sometimes at rush hour, because it's a lovely two-lane street, you know, you can't get through town at 50 miles an hour. Um, and so, you know, people were saying a lot of people are mad about that. So you have to make it something that's, that's great. So um, there's a great, in downtown Gresham, there's a great little candy store. And if things are slow, she opens her doors and you smell like specialty popcorn popping and she runs around with little samples. So what about when people are stopped for the train if you ran outside? with little popcorn samples and all of a sudden it became something that that you look forward to like oh I hope I get stopped by the train so they'll come and give me a little popcorn right and all of a sudden you would love that place you would love downtown Elk Grove what about if during rush hour when people it is a little bit slow there the community paid for like a different entertainer who was on a little corner with a an acoustical shell and there was some music playing or um, somebody was doing improv or there was you know some sort of street entertainment so you can you can make that that something that's a, a feature um, and make them enjoy and appreciate. So it's an interesting idea to incorporate into that. Uh -huh. So, um, so parking minimums is one of the policy things you're going to have to address. Uh, so here's the irony of, of parking minimums. So you, okay, ground floors take their identity. Um, from what you put in on the ground floor. So we want the most active uses, right? Because those are the ones that provide the most identity. The most active uses have the highest parking minimums. So if I have one of those small, so, so again, when I look at the arterial environment, the buildings I usually want to tackle are the ones that were built in the 70s. And they're like eight to 10,000 square feet. And I want to chop them up into small spaces. And they don't have very big parking lots. And they're fairly close to the sidewalk. And they're usually pretty close to each other. The reason I want to tackle those is if I put a couple of those right together, I've got a node that people can go to and start identifying with. But you know what? If I have one of those 8,000 square foot buildings and I put in five restaurants, I can guarantee you I don't have enough parking to meet your parking minimums. Uh, so that's a trade-off. Your parking minimums are making so you can't tenant with the very outward facing uses that are going to create life and identity uh, and vibrancy and revitalization in a district. So I'm not a big fan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Downtown Gresham recognized that um, they needed to give some love to downtown because they spent a lot of money on you know other kinds of infrastructure. So they waived impact fees for any new business starting in downtown. And then in the downtown work that I did there, uh, we had an amazing property owner who really got this connection to how he was tenanting his buildings, was having a huge impact on the success of his street. So he started the way he started tenanting differently. So he started requiring in his leases that tenants uh, have an outward facing presence on the sidewalk. He started working with his tenants to make that happen. And then he actually bought a business and moved it down the street uh, so he could put in an outward facing uh, restaurant tenant. So he worked to assemble, and this is over the course of a year and a half, he changed a whole side of a block from a completely dead block um, to a completely vibrant block. And for the first time, he's had two tenants so successful that they've expanded. It has never happened to him in all the time that he's owned property in Gresham. And part of the reason those businesses could go in is there's no parking minimum and because they had done the impact fee waiver. And he has now achieved the highest rents 
after just a year and a half that he's ever gotten in owning uh, property in, in downtown Gresham. So um, those things have connections. And so well, where there's a will, there's a way. You know, it depends on, on how badly you want to shuffle things around to make it work. Yeah. So what attracts these creative developers to these ugly boxes and underutilized properties? They're a little crazy. Uh, so they usually have some local connection. <laughs> Well, you know, so the first thing I would say, it's a puzzle. And you have to love that puzzle. So new construction is very different from adaptive reuse. And uh, I don't know a lot of developers that cross over really well between the two. I mean, there are people that do both. Um, but, but adaptive reuse is a very particular puzzle. And it's a puzzle that a lot of people don't like. So one of the first things you have to do is find people who want to curate tenants, who want to work with people and figure out how to put things together, who want to take on smaller projects and uh, piece together working with cities and jurisdictions and code and, and how to kind of make those things work. So they they tend to be people who enjoy that puzzle. Um, they tend to have a local component. So a lot of times they come out of the local community. So um, if you were Rancho Cordova and you know you had one of those strip malls and you went around and you talked to some of the people who were doing the wholesale um, kind of design um, contractor supply work, you might find one of them who was like, you know, I've done a bunch of these in different places and supplied stuff and I've always wanted to try one of those and maybe that's interesting. So sometimes it comes out of that kind of thing. You can look, I mean, if you control property, you can find people who do this stuff all over and try and attract them. But usually wait, they come out of the, the local population in some way. They, they may have um, invested locally. I've seen people who've worked up through multifamily. Um, they started with a house, then they started buying multifamily and fixing it up, and then they got into commercial. Um, so, so you might want to look to your urban core where a lot of adaptive reuses happen. There are people here who have expertise around adaptive reuse in different kinds of forms, and that's moving outward in Sacramento. And so keep moving them outward. Those are places to look. But they have to like the puzzle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in a variety of places. Um, and you know, it really depends. Th this comes out of relationship a little bit, though. So what's interesting about districts that start to revitalize and change is there's always a strong network of relationships um, between a weird mix of people, property owners, businesses, residents, just general stakeholders are interested. And as you're working together on these projects and you're collaborating to figure out how you can all make these things work, <clears throat> you're also building a network of people who are going to be really interested in the end result. And so um, Alberta Street in Portland had a network of small um, property owner developers. And you know, if one of them had a tenant call them and say, hey, uh, I'm interested in space, if he didn't have space but he thought it'd be a great tenant for the street, um, then he would say, call these other three people who are doing projects because you should be on the street. And if you're on the street, that's going to help me uh, and my projects. And so that's an example of how you know, relationship building. In some cases, people have gone out and said, um, you know, what is the best Thai food in the entire region? We're going to bring them to this location, and I'm going to attract them there. Sometimes it's the developer. Sometimes it's brokers they work with. Sometimes it's property owners have their own network. Sometimes it comes out of this cauldron of relationship. But it's, it's again, it's not hanging a shingle and waiting for the phone to ring. Yeah, and it's going to be a mix of people, and it kind of depends on the team that comes together for a specific project. Mm -hmm. You talked about connectivity, um, and I'm a cyclist, and a lot of the bike paths around here have a combined pedestrian use, and I don't believe that's compatible. What's your opinion? I think that's pretty tough. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we actually experience that quite a bit in Elk Grove because the sidewalk is the bikeway. Um, because there's just really not room at, at rush hour. And so a lot of the businesses talked about people will open the door and walk out of the business and get hit by a bike, um, which is a little scary. And we had <laughs> one kid, I, I, who, I mean, he came to this really cool stunt skidding stop, you know, right in front of somebody in our, our tour. Um, so, uh, so I don't think that that, that does work really well. I, I agree with you. I actually have a comment on Sharrows, though, with the road bike. Um, I was at a presentation uh, about bike share, and the guys that did the Miami bike share um, talked about 
what a huge impact those had because it was a community that had no cycling infrastructure, no bike lanes whatsoever, no kind of um, culture around that. Because I tend to look, you know, in Portland, we're sort of cycling snobs. And so I'm sort of like, oh, Sharrows, what do they do? But he said it had a huge impact on raising awareness for drivers. And they saw a really big change in how people behaved. And um, so I thought that was just interesting feedback from a community that had, had sort of no cycling infrastructure. Um, they felt they were really, really helpful and it had started to change minds about that. So there was a, yes, sorry, Mike. Okay. Yeah, that's, does that sound flexible yeah. or creative? So that's part of, of where the flexibility is going to come into. So I'm going to talk about um, one of my favorite uses for revitalization and it's the one represented by this design district use, is wholesale showroom and manufacturing showroom. Now, it has to be the right kind of manufacturing. So uh, one of the examples I use all the time, one of the top tourist draws in the state of Oregon is the Tillamook Cheese Factory. It's right on a state highway, and you can stop in and get some ice cream, and I don't know what you buy at the gift shop. And, um, and you can see cheese being packaged and <laughs> sitting in vats you know, cheesing up. And um, so, uh, but it's that connection, right? It's that connection of being able to see it being made in the place where it all started um, and then stopping and getting an ice cream on your way to the coast. Um, that combination, there's a real um, connection right now with artisanal manufacturing or daylighting specialty kinds of production and having something in the front. Distilleries are a great example with a tasting room and a showroom in a front. Brew pubs uh, are an interesting example. You want to daylight the manufacturing component of it, though. You want to be able to see things uh, happening. There's a big production bakery in Portland, and they have a small, it's in a warehouse district, and they have a small, um, fantastic eating area up front. But the entire thing is glassed in along the edges, so you can see the entire baking production line. And it's super compelling and it's really fun to go there. Those kinds of uses are fantastic. If you have a, somebody who is, is hand making incredible furniture in your communities or doing amazing metal work, you know, those kinds of things create really compelling showrooms, great ways of making um, activity in your, in your parking lots. Um, and if you daylight that kind of artisanal production, it's really saying something about your community, but it probably wouldn't be on your allowed list of, of uses. So, yeah. No, I was going to say, just a comment. They keep no dirt them well. There's not one of us that's got a retail zone. Still allows manufacturing. Yeah. Whether it's cheese or. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.
Um, they have double hung windows from 1900 through to really ugly vinyl windows from the 80s. And they had somebody put together in this great puzzle piece um, all of these windows. Um, and they used that with some reclaimed lumber to create the walls for their unheated warehouse. So they're showing what they do. They don't tell. They're right on a mixed use, two way street, really charming. Um, Main Street, and it's super successful, and everything they sell is used, and it's fantastic. Um, so, so outlying use is not solving your problem that you have, um, uh, you know, an underinvested corridor, and you have parking minimums that are too high, and you have fees that make it hard to open the businesses that you need to open, uh, and that you need to provide technical assistance to a community that doesn't know how to take this infrastructure and make it better. Mm -hmm. Right. The state of Washington, actually, it's really hard to do TIF, and so they have to get creative as well because legally it's pretty hard to do traditional urban renewal. So, um, uh, so, so they get creative. They can't always do sort of the grand projects, and it makes them have to be uh, a little more guerrilla and a little more strategic. They use CDBG funds. Um, they find other ways of uh, trying to partner. Um, they use some sales tax. I don't know if you guys do this in California. Um, they have a contribution program where companies can, um, if they donate so much, they can get a sales tax write-off for a portion of that. And that can go to a local community um, to improve itself. And so that's how they fund some of their downtown associations. And then they put that money into marketing. And so you might want to look to Washington State. It's an interesting program. And that's how they fund some of their local organizational capacity. So did you want to? Yeah, well, let Mike ask the last question. Okay. And we have a couple quick announcements. All right. Just I want to go back to uh, Supervisor McLaughlin's question about how you kind of find the developers mm -hmm. and just focus a little more uh, of your smart staff in the room here. It seemed to me from the tour you took us on in Portland that something you said earlier that getting one or two model projects or neighborhoods or districts, whatever you want to call it, is, is one really key to getting people interested. But the other the theory would be that how the physical space is designed, created, broken up to coax the local entrepreneurs out of their homes or shells or wherever and into the space. If you could just talk a little bit more, I'm thinking about that one building on Mississippi Avenue with a small office on the mm -hmm. second floor and how you counsel them to size and shape the right. retail space. So, so, and let me talk about that sort of in two phases. So the, the other thing about developers is programs matter. So Portland had a facade improvement program. They had a, if you brought some jobs program, you would get, you know, they had created an ecosystem where people who had some money and some resources and some knowledge were interested in bringing that to the table because they created a financial ecosystem that it would make sense to take a risk on a district and do something like this. So that's a piece of it too. Um, uh, the second thing is, is once you have this project, it's really important that you understand how to break it up so you're appealing to this, this tenant pool. And most of your arterial infrastructure is big, um, and it's not going to appeal to that tenant pool. So there are a couple things that you have to think about in terms of tenanting. One is uh, how you divide space up, and then two is who you put in there. So you have to think about hours of operation. You don't want people who are just going to be open at 9 and close at 5. So you have to think about breakfast to bar. That's your arc. Um, and, and that's how I tenant in emerging districts, is, is I think about that arc. And then you have to think about the sizes. And you really work backwards from price point. So a small restaurant in that district in Portland um, could pay about 1200 to 1500 a month for a restaurant. So we designed spaces around that. And that meant that spaces were around 1,000 to 1,500 square feet, because that's what worked in that market. So you have to work backward from what that person can afford, uh, and then what size you know, works out for that. So I had, in that project, we had three different kinds of spaces. We had some live work spaces. We had, I had about four or 5,000 square feet of second floor space with no off-street parking. Um, and then I had a bunch of ground floor spaces. So we divided all those ground floor spaces into spaces that range from about 600 square feet um, to about maybe about 1,700. 
And then I had this weird, gigantic industrial corner space that was in the back corner of the building and had no retail presence. So I'm like, OK, I need a production user so that I can shove back there and not have to do anything to that space, because it has no retail value. And you're not going to attract somebody locally who's going to take a 4,000 square foot space, generally. So um, I, we put in Laughing Planet. And Laughing Planet does healthy fast food. They're open for breakfast uh, through dinner. They reflect the ethos of the district. It's affordable food. It's healthy food. Um, and we had them put their production kitchen in the back and a retail in the front. And they were also an important tenant for activating the courtyard. And they got um, a really great deal because they were sort of the linchpin of building the rest of this. Um, then the office space. So I have a whole bunch of office space with no off-street parking. The first thing is, is you don't tenant it first because um, they want amenities. So I had to think about the amenities that we put in that tenanting downstairs. So they want lunch places and they want coffee. So you have to make sure you have some component of that um, uh, within your, your ground floor uses. So we tenanted the ground floor. And then we looked at the upstairs. So when I have second floor space with no off-street parking, I want small office spaces because those tend to be people who are local. Um, and so they don't care as much about parking. They might be bogging. They might be walking. Um, when office uses in our market get above 1,500 square feet, then parking becomes the key driver of where they locate. But when they're smaller than 1,500 square feet, location and the finish of the office space becomes the key driver in where they decide to locate. So what we did is took very nondescript, incredibly boring second floor office space, and we put in wood floors and made it cool. Uh, we divided it so that we, we just put a double loaded corridor down the middle. Um, and so we made it so that each one could be divided down into about a 250 square foot office, and each one would have its own operable window. In Portland, being able to open your window is very important. Um, and we didn't put the walls in at first. What you do is you just build one. And then you have somebody come in, because these people don't do floor plans, and they stand in one. And they're like, oh, yeah, I got like three employees and some computers. I'll take two of these. Um, and then you build the wall for the two. And, the, and then you, you just knock those out. The other thing we did is you can't have this in creative office space. So we had to have a drop ceiling, because I had a bunch of systems up there. But instead of acoustical tile, we did a drop ceiling with marine grade plywood and corrugated metal and some recessed canister lights, not these big lights. Um, and we, res we, we recessed it from the walls a little bit um, so that it became this sort of architectural feature, because there's this shadow around it. And so even though the ceiling's a little bit low, it was re absorbed really well in that market. People really thought it was cool. And it was a very affordable thing to do. Um, so that's an example of how you might creatively um, uh, tenant and kind of curate a project like that. Is that what you want me to answer? Well, why don't we give a hand to Portland State University and Michelle. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, this is uh, the first of, uh, we're trying to do some special workshops at SACOG to really cater to what the needs of our local governments and our communities are. So if you have some ideas, uh, please contact me, give us some feedback. Uh, the next special workshop we've got is on December 12th at 2 p.m. on CEQA and legal processes. Um, so we'll give, <laughs> didn't sound very interesting, but yeah. <laughs> Boy, people are gonna wait in line for that. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll send out the announcement of exactly what that is very shortly, but that's, that's uh, coming up. And then in uh, January, we're also talking about uh, grant writing and uh, census, uh, getting census data. Uh, we'll put out an announcement about that pretty soon. Don't forget, for those that are needing the AICP credits, uh, fill, fill out the blue form and return it over here on, on the sheet. And for those of you uh, specifically working on the three projects that Michelle's in town for, the, the workshop is uh, in the room next door starting at 11.30. And if you don't know about that, that means you're, you're working on the workshop. Uh, so <laughs> don't go there for the free lunch. It's not free. <laughs> All right, thank you again.